Recently I was searching for a Twin Paradox videos on YouTube just to see how other people on the platform solved it, so that I can bring something new into the topic or explain it in a different way. And I stumbled across this video from the channel Fermilab with the name of Twin Paradox The Real Explanation. The video is very well made, there is a math involved and it's made by professional, so no one would actually dare to question it. But with all the respect to the Dr. Lincoln, I don't think the explanation is very real, nor I think it's explanation of a twin paradox at all. So what is the problem? Dr. Lincoln claims he can solve the paradox without acceleration by introducing not two, but three observers A, B and C. He introduces three locations, 1, 2 and 3, that are separated by distances L and 2L. And then he places observer A and B to the first location and the observer C to the third location. The observer B is moving with the velocity V to the right and the observer C is moving with the velocity minus V to the left and all observers have initially zero on their clocks. And now the most important thing. This initial configuration was set in a rest frame of the observer A and therefore in order to figure out the coordinates of other observers, we need to use the famous Lorentz transforms. And this is how it plays out according to channel Fermilab. So here's what we're going to do. When we start the experiment, all three observers are going to start a stopwatch. When observer B and C cross paths at the center, observer B holds up a big digital clock that observer C can read. That clock records how long it took for observer B to go from location 1 to location 2. Observer C also writes down the time they see on their own stopwatch as they cross location 2. Observer C then travels back to position 1. As they pass location 1, they hold up a big digital billboard that shows the reading on their clock as they pass location 1, the reading on their clock as they pass location 2, and the amount of time it took observer B to get to location 2. You can then work out the amount of time it took observer C to get from location 2 to 1 and add it to the amount of time that observer B took to get from 1 to 2. Okay, that feels pretty logical, but how does this situation play out if you actually show the clocks? The time dilation equation is simple. It doesn't depend on the orientation. So, from the reference frame of the observer A, the observer B and C get the same time dilation and therefore at the meeting point their clock will read the same time. And now the observer C should read the clock of the observer B and continue his journey towards the observer A. Then at the meeting point we just add the second part of the observer C's clock and the screenshot of the observer's B clock. And we have the total time for the traveling observer, which we can compare with the observer's A clock. But this part here is actually exactly the same as this part. So you might ask, why we even need the observer B? The whole situation kind of reduced to a simple time dilation problem. But this is not the end of the video, so let's take a look at the calculations. According to Lincoln, there are three important events we have to take into account. Event 1. The moment observer B departed from Earth. The meeting point and the second meeting point at the observer's A location. Now we can figure out the space-time coordinates of these events for each observer. And of course the simplest observer to consider is the observer A as the whole configuration was set in his rest frame. So the space-time coordinates of the event 1 is just 0, 0, which is just by definition. The second event happens at the position of L and time L over V, as the classical equation for time, distance and velocity says. And the third event happens again at the position of 0 and the time of 2L over V. And this is exactly what Dr. Lincoln proposes. Okay, now it gets a little trickier when we consider the observer B. The event 1 is still easy though. The position is 0 by definition 
and time is also zero by definition. To find out the spacetime coordinates of the second event, we can use the coordinates of the observer A and use the Lorentz transforms. Here the math is a little bit involved, but still very simple and also exactly what we would expect. The position is zero since the observer B is exactly at the location of the event and time is reduced by this gamma factor since the length he traveled in his coordinates is shorter due to length contraction. For the event 3, if you do the math, you get this, which also agrees with the numbers of Dr. Lincoln. But now it gets really tricky if we consider the observer C. According to Lincoln, the space-time coordinates look like this. Event 1 happens at the space-time position of 0, 0, but if you look at the picture, this doesn't seem to be correct. In special relativity, every observer is maximally selfish and considers himself as a center of the whole universe and stationary. And therefore, this third observer should have spatial coordinate at this position B0. And therefore, the coordinate at the position of event 1 has to be something else. And what about time coordinate? I told you the whole configuration was set in a rest frame of the observer A. And for this observer, the observers B and C departure simultaneously at time equals zero. But from my previous videos, you already know that simultaneity is relative if you have a spatially separated events. So if these two observers departure at the same time for the observer A, this can't be true for the observer C, since they are spatially separated and moving relative to each other. So let's take a look at the simultaneity planes for these two observers. This is the simultaneity plane for the observer A, when observer B and C simultaneously departure. Then if you take the velocity of the observer C, for example 0.87C, then his coordinates would look like this. And this is his simultaneity plane. So as you can see, at the time zero of the observer C, the observer B has departure a long time ago, and therefore it can't be zero as Lincoln proposes. The problem is that Lincoln used these Lorentz transforms to get his results. But the problem is that these Lorentz transforms apply only to observers who started at the same location. And that is why it worked well for the observer B, but not so much for the observer C, since there is no information about the initial spatial separation. The question is, what are the full Lorentz transforms? And the only thing you have to do is a small modification, where this term here is the difference between the position you are transforming to and your position. So let's figure out the correct coordinates of the observer C with these upgraded transforms. So for the event 1, the coordinates for the observer A is just 0, 0. And if you plug it into the transforms, this is what you get. And it was pretty simple. For the second event, the calculation is more involved, but in the end, you get the result you would expect. The position is zero as the event is at the same location as the observer C. And the time on his clock is exactly what would you get using the length contraction. And finally for the event C, you get again expected result. Since the event is again at the same position as the observer C and the time according to length contraction. So now you can do the same business calculating the time interval between event 2 and 1 for the observer B and add to that the time difference between event 3 and 2 for the observer C. And you get the same thing that has already been on the clock of the observer C. And suddenly the explanation of a twin paradox doesn't seem to be anything more than just a time dilation problem. Natural question, however, is that since time dilation is symmetrical, then if you look at the problem from the observer C's perspective, the distance is shorter, and moreover, the observer's A clock 
is slower. How can the observer A be older at the meeting point? And this is classical clock synchronization problem. If we make the separation 20 light years and velocity of minus 0.87c, then if you look at the space-time diagram, as I already showed you, for the observer C, there is already 17.4 years on the clock of the observer A. And now, since the distance for the observer C is just 10 light years, it will take him 11.5 years to reach the observer A. But the clock of the observer A is slower by 2, and therefore it will add only another 5.75 years to the observer's A clock, making it roughly 23 years as it should be. There are many questions you might ask, for example, since for observer C, the observer B has departed a long time ago at his time zero, how it is possible they meet near the star if they are moving with the same velocities towards it? And the answer is, in a way, we add velocities in special relativity. For the observer C, the star is moving with the velocity 0.661c towards him, but the observer B is moving with the velocity given by this formula, which gives you roughly 0.9898c. Here be very careful to use very precise numbers when adding velocities in special relativity, because rounding can actually bring a big error in your calculations down the road. I use the velocity of 0.8661, so the gamma factor is roughly 2. Now you can subtract the velocity of the star from the velocity of the observer B, and you get the rate at which the observer B is approaching the star in a reference frame of the observer C, and it is just 0.1237c. The distance the observer B has to travel in the reference frame of the observer C is 5 light years, and therefore the whole journey should take 40.42 years. But if you remember, the space-time coordinates of the first event for the observer C, you will find out that the observer B has departed 34.67 years ago in the reference frame of the observer C, and it will take him another 5.75 years to reach the star. This is exactly the same time as it will take the observer C to reach the star, and therefore they will reach the star at the same time. And of course, the gamma factor for the observer B is 7.02, and if you take the time of 40.42 years and divide it by this number, you get 5.75, which is the observer's B clock's reading at the position of the star. It's always nice to see the numbers eventually add up perfectly when you do the calculations correctly. Notice one crucial thing. When I calculated the speed of the observer B in the frame of the observer C, I had to use the relativistic addition formula. However, when I calculated the rate at which the observer B is approaching the star in the frame of the observer C, I used classical addition formula. The reason is that when I calculated the approaching rate, I used the velocities as measured from the same reference frame, namely C. In the other case, I used velocities as measured by the observer A in the frame of the observer C. I wanted to briefly mention this because I have encountered people who see no difference between these two cases. Okay, enough of numbers. There is another thing I disagree with Dr. Lincoln. All of the time dilation, which is to say the shortening of the time experienced by the traveler, occurs during the acceleration periods. However, this explanation is totally wrong. Now, if you thought this was the explanation, don't feel bad. So the twin paradox is made of two parts, the outgoing journey and ingoing journey. And this makes 100% of the trip. Time dilation is symmetrical, and therefore, during 100% of the trip, both observers can claim to be perfectly stationary and see other clocks running slower. So, 
how can we make one observer younger eventually? If there is a true time shift somewhere, it must have happened continuously, right? Because nature is continuous. The only thing we left out from the story is the acceleration part. And therefore, if there is a true aging happening somewhere, it must be happening during this part. Otherwise, there is just no any other time period where this could happen. So, saying the acceleration is not responsible for the aging in Twin Paradox is completely false. And I will explain it hopefully in the next video. In this video, I want to thank people who bought me coffees on buymecoffee.com. Milton, Alex, Ben and Jason. As I haven't done so in a video yet, but this has a huge impact on my motivation to create more. As this is really time consuming and it's really nice to see some reward for the work. So thank you again. Acceleration in special relativity is kinda hot topic. And you might wonder whether it is absolute or relative, like velocity, for example. Dialect like, thinks it's relative, but I think he is wrong. And I have made a video about it. You can watch it here. And I see you there.